All right, well, uh, thank you very much. Um, let me just uh, reiterate also to start with, uh, thank you so much for your generosity. Um, it's greatly appreciated and I feel uh, very privileged and lucky to be working here at the Institute. Okay, um, so I'm gonna talk today about um, the universe's oldest light, the cosmic microwave background radiation, uh, which, which came up um, there in the intro a little bit. Uh, this is an image of this radiation. I'll describe this in some detail in the next few minutes. Uh, this comes from a European Space Agency satellite called Planck, uh, which observed the sky from roughly 2009 to 2012, um, and has, it's kind of the state of the art uh, in this field. Um, and the talk is gonna focus on sort of these three themes, dust, distortions, and shadows. Um, and I'm going to start out with uh, talking about some recent controversy in our field centered around a problem involving dust, which might sound boring, but is actually pretty interesting. Okay, so let's start with an empirical fact that hopefully everyone is aware of. Uh, the universe is expanding. So what that means is that the distance between, say, pairs of galaxies is increasing with time. It's not expanding into something, but the distance between, say, uh, two widely separated galaxies is increasing with time. So what does that imply? Uh, one thing that it implies is that the average density of matter in the universe is decreasing, just as you make the, the volume larger, the, the density must decrease. Also, the typical uh, temperature of the contents is decreasing. Um, this is the same as if you had some gas in a box and then you let the box expand, the temperature of the gas will, will decrease. So that's what we know, but let's then hit rewind on the movie and ask what this tells us about conditions in the universe at earlier times. Well, eventually, if you go back to an extremely early time, the temperature will be very, very high, and the density will also be very, very high. And eventually, it becomes so hot and so dense that the universe is actually opaque to light. So what happens is that matter is organized into a, a plasma. So you have protons and electrons that we're familiar with, as well as these uh, photons of light. Um, and these are so dense and so hot uh, that the photons are just constantly scattering off of the electrons. So it's sort of this hot, dense fog. That was what the, the very early universe looked like. Now, as the universe expands, it cools down, and eventually it cools down enough that the electrons join up with the protons and they form hydrogen atoms that we all remember uh, from you know, high school chemistry or physics. Um, and at that point, the light can just free stream away. Um, and the light, of course, the radiation has also cooled down uh, as well. And the moment when this happens is about 380,000 years after the Big Bang, after the, the origin of the universe. Um, and that's the light that we're seeing in the cosmic microwave background. Um, so this is obviously very cool. It gives us a window onto what the universe looked like almost at the instant of its creation. The universe is about 13.8 billion years old, uh, as we now know uh, with, with pretty high precision. And so what are we actually seeing in this map of the early, early universe? But what these colors represent are very small fluctuations in the density um, of material and its temperature at this time. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about why these fluctuations are so important. Um, the reason is, is the following. So one other fact about the universe is that matter uh, in the universe is becoming clumpier over time. And why is that happening? It's just gravity. If you start out with some, some distribution of matter, gravity tends to pull stuff together. Um, and that's why galaxies form, that's why stars form and, and planets form. It's sort of the reason why we're here at all. Um, so the reason that this uh, map of the CMB is so neat is that this gives us a picture of what the initial conditions looked like uh, for the formation of all the structure in the universe. So we have a pretty good understanding of how this process works and we simulate it on computers. Um, I'm gonna show you a movie here of a formation, of a simulation of, of cosmological structure formation which starts about 200 million years after the Big Bang. So this is you know, quite a while after the CMB uh, map that we can measure um, after those photons are emitted, uh, but it's you know, a long time ago. It's 13.6 billion years ago. And the movie will play all the way from the initial, that initial time to uh, the current time. Uh, and we're looking here at scales that are about 150 million uh, light years across uh, on, this, uh, on this diagram. Uh, and this is, so this is zoomed way out, right? What we're seeing here is collections of galaxies. There's millions and millions of galaxies in an image like this. So we're zoomed way out. And what you're seeing is that the galaxies, the matter tend to, to fall together, to clump into this filamentary structure uh, with large agglomerations at the nodes of this structure, which is where you would find a very large cluster of galaxies containing maybe hundreds or 
for thousands of galaxies, and then these large empty uh, void-like regions in between. So we start from this very smooth distribution that looks like this, and then just let gravity act on that, and that produces all of the beautiful structure that we see in the universe. So if we zoomed in on this movie, we could look at the evolution of you know, a single galaxy, which would basically be like a point um, on the scale of this, this image. So the CMB gives us a picture of what the initial conditions looked like for this process to happen. Um, this is pretty neat. Um, but this raises an important question, which is, uh, what's the origin of those fluctuations in the first place? I want to emphasize here that these are very, very small fluctuations. So the CMB, when it was first discovered by Penzias and Wilson, uh, just up the road in Holmdale, New Jersey, when they were working at Bell Labs, uh, they would have basically made the picture like this. So it was just a uniform white noise. Uh, it's, it's very cold. It's about 2.7 degrees above absolute zero. Um, and it's very uniform. So it looks almost the same in the sky in all directions. Now, if you increase the contrast on the image progressively with better and better detectors, better and better experiments, eventually you increase the contrast by a factor of 10,000 and you can see these tiny differences in the temperature from place to place. So all I'm trying to convey here is that this distribution was really very, very smooth. There were nothing like galaxies yet at this time. Galaxies, of course, are very clumpy objects, um, and the universe was, was very smooth at this time. Instead, there were just these um, smoothly distributed clouds of hydrogen and helium gas, as well as dark matter, which later collapsed to form galaxies. Um, so this gives us our picture of essentially the, the initial conditions for the formation of structure in the universe. Uh, and again, this is the oldest light that we can observe in the universe because of this hot, dense fog that existed before this time. So this is pretty neat, but again, it raises this question of where did those small differences come from in the first place? You could just posit that they were put there, but as scientists, that's not the way we work. So we want to have a theory for where these came from. Um, there's a number of ideas out there. The one that uh, has gotten the most traction over the last 30 years or so is called inflation. So let me just give you a schematic picture of how this works. The idea of inflation is that very early in the history of the universe, so something like 10 to the minus 30 seconds after the, the, the very beginning, the universe underwent this exponential accelerating expansion where it expanded from a size of a, about a proton or smaller than a proton uh, to a size larger than a grapefruit. So that's something like 15 orders of magnitude um, or 45 orders of magnitude in volume. So that's pretty dramatic. Um, and this has a lot of nice properties uh, that solve a number of cosmological conundrums, one of which is, is, is this. Um, so for example, uh, this exponential expansion, it smooths and homogenizes the universe. So this is a toy picture here. This is not meant to represent reality. But imagine that you lived on the surface of this sphere. You might initially think it looks like it has a lot of curvature. But then if you blow the sphere up with some process like inflation, it gets bigger, it gets bigger, it gets bigger. Eventually, the patch around you looks like it's flat. And you don't actually know that you're living on this, this curved uh, geometry. So that's nice. That kind of explains this uh, picture where things look very uniform. Now the question is, can we also explain where these small fluctuations come from? And inflation very beautifully explains that. Um, schematically, the idea is, is the following. So inflation is a quantum mechanical process, because again, we're talking about very, very early times when the universe was very, very small. Um, so in quantum mechanics, uh, we have to follow something called the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, which basically tells you that you can't always precisely know um, certain, certain things. So you can't precisely know both the position and momentum of a particle, for instance. Uh, in the case of inflation, what it means is that you can't exactly localize um, the amount of energy in this field that's driving inflation, and that leads to some quantum fluctuations in the field. So if we zoomed in on our toy picture, what we would see is some geometry that has all of these sort of uh, wild quantum fluctuations happening on small scales. Operationally, physically, what happens is that some patches of the universe stop inflating earlier than others. Uh, and, that, and those small differences from place to place, from patch to patch, lead to the density and temperature fluctuations that we see in the CMB. Um, so this theory quantitatively explains the properties of this map, um, which is pretty amazing. Um, moreover, it makes prediction, a unique prediction, for an additional signal that we can look for in the data. And in particular, it's this gravitational wave signal. So this inflationary expansion um, is violent and produces disturbance in space-time itself, 
uh, which leads this gravitational wave signal that we can look for. You may have heard about gravitational waves in the news over the last year or two because the LIGO experiment made the first detection of gravitational waves. Uh, but the LIGO detection was a uh, detection of uh, gravitational waves from merging black holes and neutron stars, whereas what we're talking about here are gravitational waves from the beginning of the universe. So they're both gravitational waves, but these are long wavelength gravitational waves that are of order the size of the universe, whereas the LIGO gravitational waves come from particular objects. Okay, so how would we actually detect these primordial gravitational waves? This is sort of the holy grail of experimental CMB or cosmology research at the moment. Um, it was pointed out by Matthias Zaldariaga and others in 1997, uh, Matthias is a, is a faculty member here at the Institute now, uh, that a, a unique signature of, of these primordial gravitational waves would be a B-mode polarization pattern in a CMB. So just to remind you, polarization is just the direction of the electric field uh, associated with light as it travels through space. Uh, so your sunglasses work often by removing one of the polarization uh, states of light. Um, so you can look for this particular polarization pattern in the light in the CMB. Uh, the B mode is this swirly looking pattern which can only be generated by the gravitational waves in the early universe. We've detected this E mode type pattern in the CMB already, um, which has these radial or tangential uh, vectors. But the B mode pattern with this swirly um, type shape uh, hasn't been detected. However, there was a claim of a detection, which you might have heard about in the news, in March of 2014. This was uh, a huge deal. It was on the fr front page of the New York Times. Um, set off a huge wave of activity in, in cosmology and fundamental physics broadly. Um, the detection was claimed by an experiment called BICEP2, uh, shown here, which is at the South Pole. Um, and this is the map of, that they presented of these B modes, where you can see this swirly pattern by eye. This is pretty amazing. First time I saw this, uh, I was very impressed. Um, but crucially, this is only observed at one single frequency. So when we look out into the universe, we have to look through our galaxy. We have to look really through other galaxies as well. There's a lot of stuff out there. And what we want is this cosmic microwave background. Remember, it's a background, so it's behind everything. Uh, it's possible that there are other foreground signals, or we know that there are other foreground signals that we have to remove when we do these measurements. So shortly after that announcement was made, um, Myself, Raphael Flauger, who was a member here at the time, and David Spurgel, who's a professor at Princeton, uh, who was my PhD advisor, we looked into this claim in some detail, um, and we showed that, in fact, the signal looked to be uh, consistent with a foreground emission coming from polarized dust in our galaxy. Um, and this was later confirmed very beautifully by the Planck collaboration using maps of the sky at a different frequency of light where the dust emission is stronger. So what you're seeing here is a map of the polarized dust in our galaxy. We've taken a sphere here and unfolded it uh, into this oval type shape. So our galaxy, the Milky Way, is in the plane uh, on the equator of this uh, image. And then uh, the region that the BICEP team observed was this patch down here, roughly. So obviously things are worse in the, in the plane, but their patch was not as clean of dust as they had hoped. Um, and this led to them uh, essentially retracting their, their claim of detection. Uh, so this was sad. Uh, it was sad because we all wanted this detection to be real, uh, but it's more important to get things right than to uh, hope that they're true when they're not. Uh, fortunately, there's a path forward. Uh, like many things in life, we just need to sweep away the dust. Um, and how are we going to do this? Uh, the real key is to observe at multiple frequencies, as I kind of alluded to a second ago. So if you observe the sky at different frequencies or different wavelengths of light, different sources of emission will dominate the sky. So these are maps from the Planck satellite, again, uh, spanning from 100 gigahertz to 353 gigahertz uh, in polarization. Um, just to orient you, this is roughly a wavelength of about one millimeter, which is sort of the same that your microwave oven operates at. Um, and you can see that the sky at these higher frequencies is much more dominated by this uh, galactic emission, which is concentrated towards the plane here, than at lower frequencies where the, the contamination is not as bad. So operationally, our, our goal really is to combine the data at many different frequencies to remove the contamination and leave behind this primordial signal if it exists. Uh, so that's the path forward. We, we really need very sensitive measurements at many frequencies. Another way of attacking the problem is to use other types of data to constrain our knowledge of these galactic foregrounds 
Again, these are associated with our galaxy, the Milky Way. Uh, this is an example uh, that Susan and I worked on. Susan's here in the room, Susan Clark, uh, who's also a member now at the IS. Uh, this is a, uh, a study that we did a couple of years ago where we used data from uh, well, radio, radio telescopes about the distribution of hydrogen gas in our galaxy uh, to show that it could be um, usefully combined with CMB data or data at microwave frequencies to provide better foreground models uh, to, to remove uh, these contaminants. Uh, we're working on follow-up work to this right now, actually. Um, if you want to know more about this beyond the pretty pictures shown here, I'm happy to talk about it afterwards. Or you can ask Susan as well. Okay, so that's the, the situation with the dust. Uh, we're really going after this. I'll, I'll talk at the end about some ongoing and upcoming experiments with significant amounts of money invested to try to find this primordial B-mode signal. Um, but now I want to talk about uh, two other topics in CMB research that I think are quite interesting uh, related to distortions and shadows. So for the purposes of this part of the talk, you should think about the CMB not as a background, but as a backlight. So the CMB is, again, the, the oldest and most distant radiation we can observe in the universe. Um, and of course, then we have to contend with these foregrounds that can contaminate it. But also, you can think of the CMB as a backlight that illuminates the entire universe uh, between us um, and that, that early time. So this is quite powerful. These uh, CMB photons, the CMB light, it traverses the entire universe on its way to our telescopes. So this is a schematic picture of the history of the universe looking back from the present day here, back to the early universe, the Big Bang is here. So the CMB, CMB light was emitted here a few hundred thousand years after the Big Bang, and then the photons travel through the entire history of the universe. Um, at first, there's not too much that happens. If you remember the, the movie I showed you, things are very smooth, and then eventually structure collapses and galaxies form, um, and then eventually you get to you know, a few billion years after the Big Bang, and you have galaxies that look kind of like the modern day. Um, and eventually something like the Milky Way over here. Um, and these photons, many things can happen to them as they travel. Uh, this movie kind of sums up the story. This was produced by the Planck Collaboration. Um, that was a picture of the Planck satellite there, um, which I should note is, is now um, out, of, out of commission, but we're still analyzing the data from it. So here is the CMB. Um, the movie is going to start uh, <clears throat> at the beginning, well, at, in the very early universe that I talked about uh, at the beginning of the talk. So this is the hot, dense fog state. Um, so the photons, the light, are these blue particles, and then electrons are these green um, circles, and protons are these, these red circles. So you can see that the light is just constantly bouncing off of the electrons. It's very hot, it's very dense, it, it can't get out. Then the universe cools enough, the hydrogen atoms form, and the light just free streams away. So then this light is traveling to us across the history of the universe. Uh, you can see the color changing because it's cooling down as time goes on just because of the expansion of the universe. Um, and then some things will happen to it. So right here it's about to get deflected by the gravity of all of this matter. So you can see a tiny deflection there as its path is bent uh, because of this gra the gravity of this structure. Now we're going to see the photon encounter an electron and it bounces off of it. This is a scattering that happens. Um, and then there'll be one more gravitational deflection here from this system. And then eventually this is our Milky Way galaxy. And we'll zoom back in and uh, the light will be detected by Planck. So that's a cartoon of everything that's happened in the history of the universe. Uh, and there's Earth. Okay. So what are these actual uh, processes in a little more detail? So first, the distortions. So what I'm really talking about here is something called gravitational lensing. So this is an effect where the path of light, in this case we're talking about light from the CMB, is bent by the gravity of intervening matter that exists in the universe. So for example, clusters of galaxies which have a lot of gravity. Um, so the CMB is back here. Again, it's a backlight now for our purposes. And the light travels through the universe and it gets bent in some way um, by, this, by this gravitational lensing. So what does this actually look like? I'm going to show you here some uh, simulated images that um, I've made uh, to show you what this effect looks like. So here's a small patch of the CMB. So we've zoomed in now. We're not looking at the whole sky. We've just zoomed, zoomed in. Uh, this is what it looks like before the lensing. This is what it looks like after the lensing. So you can see, hopefully you can see on this, uh, that there's this warping that happens as I flip between these two images. So from where the warping happens, you can infer uh, where the matter is located. Uh, in this case, it's a simulation, so I know the answer. 
Uh, you can probably guess where the answer is too. Does anybody want to venture a guess for where most of the matter was located? Here? Uh, not in the middle. There's some there, but if you look at where is the warping strongest, it's uh, mostly happening up here in the right corner, right? So there's where most of the matter was. So this is an image of, uh, of where the matter distribution was in the simulation. Of course, in the real universe, we don't know a priori where the matter was located. So instead, what we do is we use the fact that this warping changes the statistical properties of the CMB in a way that we know how to predict. Um, and actually, Matias Zaldariaga here uh, was one of the first people to work out how to do this. Um, it's now become a very uh, active field in CMB research. Um, so we've actually measured this effect, very high significance, and used it to make maps of all of the matter uh, in the universe between us and the CMB, which is, as I said, basically the whole universe. So this is an example from the Planck collaboration. This is a map of matter on the full sky, almost the full sky. We have to remove some regions where the, the galactic foreground emission is too hard to deal with. Um, the regions that are light here have more matter. The regions that are dark have less matter. Um, and again, this is encompassing you know, the, whole, the whole universe here. So the scale of these blobs is hundreds of millions of light years across. Um, so this is pretty amazing. There's a similar uh, tool that we can use to make maps of all of the gas in the universe. And this is uh, what I called shadows in the CMB. So this was predicted by um, two Russian physicists in the 60s. Uh, Rashid Sunyaev is still alive, and he's a frequent visitor here to the institute, actually. Um, so this effect they predicted uh, is what happens when a CMB photon or light uh, encounters some cloud of gas in the universe. Um, and this gas will sometimes scatter the light, um, which then leads to it casting a shadow against the CMB. Um, so this effect, the SZ effect is what we call it, tells us where the gas is located, of course, from the scattering. And there's also a, a Doppler kind of effect, which lets us tell how fast the gas is moving. So that's pretty cool. Uh, here's an example of what this looks like. So this is an image from the Atacama Cosmology Telescope, which uh, I'll talk more about in a second, a project I'm involved in. This is a, a very massive cluster of galaxies with a lot of hot gas floating around in it. Uh, it's called El Gordo, which, if you speak Spanish, will be funny. Um, this is a, a big shadow in the CMB. So I've zoomed way in here on the CMB map to extract this image. Um, but you see this, this shadow. And just to prove to you that it really is uh, a large cluster of galaxies, here's what this looks like in optical or infrared light. You can see, indeed, that there's a huge number of very red galaxies uh, at that point on the sky. Um, the mass of this cluster of galaxies is something like 10 to the 15 solar masses, so it's very large. Okay, so we have these two effects. We have these shadows, the sunyaev zeldovich effect, uh, which uh, people have, uh, including me, have uh, used to make maps of the distribution of hot gas in the universe. This is the full sky, but cut into two halves. Um, and then we have this distortion effect, this gravitational lensing, which lets us make maps of where all of the matter uh, dark and or luminous is located in the universe. So what can we actually learn from these effects? Uh, there's a, a huge number of things, of course. If you can map out where everything in the universe is, you can learn a lot of different physics. Um, one thing that I'm very excited about is related to a particle physics question. So um, there's a particle called the neutrino, which exists in the universe. Uh, it's very numerous. There are billions of them passing through us right now. Uh, but they don't interact very much with anything. Um, but we do know that they have a non-zero mass. It's a very light, they're very light particles. Um, the masses are very low, but we know that they have a non-zero mass. We don't know exactly what the mass is, but it turns out that uh, their mass can affect how structure grows in the universe. So here I'm showing an example from a simulation of the distribution of matter. This should look similar to the movie that I showed you earlier. Um, here on the left, where the universe does have massive neutrinos, and on the right, the simulated universe does not have massive neutrinos. And you can see that the two maps look quite different just by eye. Uh, of course, we use statistical tools uh, basically to compare predictions like this to the maps that we make you know, that look like this. Um, we're getting very close to making a detection. I think we'll beat the particle physicists to this, which is kind of satisfying. Um, I, I think we have a realistic uh, projection to detect the mass of the neutrino within the next five to 10 years. Um, pretty much, I would say, guaranteed. Um, of course, these maps are also very interesting. You can probe things like the properties of dark energy uh, and dark matter, uh, which I'm happy to talk to you about afterwards, but I wanted to focus just on this question. 
So how are we actually doing this in practice? Uh, we can't just si simulate things. We have to go ahead and actually measure them. Uh, so I'm going to talk about two projects that I'm involved in. Uh, first, the Advanced Atacama Cosmology Telescope. So this is a, um, a ground-based CMB experiment located in the Atacama Desert in Chile. Um, it's at an altitude of about 17,000 feet. Uh, so it's very high and dry, uh, which is exactly the right conditions for observing the sky at these frequencies. Uh, the sky in Chile does not look like this, but to our telescope it looks like this. Um, we are surveying right now with this instrument. The telescope is actually inside of this structure. This is a, a ground screen that's built around the telescope. Um, we're observing right now. The survey will go roughly to the end of the decade. Um, there's a large number of institutions involved. Uh, Princeton has been the lead uh, for the ACT project for many years now. Uh, Suzanne Staggs and, and Lyman Page uh, in the physics department are the two main uh, PIs. Um, so this is ongoing. The next thing that's going to happen is called the Simons Observatory. Um, this is very generously funded by the Simons Foundation, um, namesake of the building we're in as well. Um, and this is a combination of the ACT team uh, as well as um, a, another team located nearby in, in the Atacama Desert called the Simons Array. Um, here is the ACT telescope inside of the ground screen. You can see it there. Um, so we're, we're located uh, nearby each other on this site in the Atacama Desert. Um, we're going to build a number of new telescopes on this site. Uh, I'll show one of them in a second. Um, we've secured about $50 million of funding, $40 million of which is from the Simons Foundation. Uh, we're currently engaged in a, a large um, and detailed amount of planning, um, design, and forecasting. Um, and our schedule calls for us to have new telescopes and cameras installed at the site by 2020, which is a very rapid pace um, for experimental cosmology, um, and to be observing by the early part of the next decade. So I'm very excited about this. It's going to be a huge step forward. Um, there's a lot of people involved, about 200 researchers uh, at this point, covering many countries and many institutions. Um, the culture of cosmology is kind of starting to change because we need so much uh, experimental sensitivity and computational power to undertake these projects that you can't just work with a few people anymore. It's, it's turning into a much larger endeavor. Um, here is uh, the design for the large, there's going to be a large telescope and then a series of small telescopes in the Simons Observatory. We just signed a contract with uh, a firm in Germany to build this telescope a few weeks ago, and this is a rendering of it. So this is as tall as a Boeing 737 from the ground up to the top of the tail fin of the airplane. So it's quite tall. Uh, and then this dish inside of here, the mirror, is about 20 feet across. Uh, so this is a very large machine. Um, we're going to put a series of different um, detectors in there at many different frequencies uh, so we can remove these, these foreground contaminants that I talked about in the first part of the talk, the dust, et cetera. And we're also going to build a set of smaller telescopes, which are optimized exclusively just for the search for primordial gravitational waves, um, as well as, again, things like dust cleaning. Uh, to remove these foregrounds. So it's a very exciting project, um, and I'm very excited to be involved in it. Um, just going to wrap up by showing a few other things that uh, are going on in cosmology. I just touched on the ones I'm involved in, but there's balloon experiments like Ebex and Spider. Spider is another Princeton project. Um, there's also a number of other experiments at the South Pole, some of our competitors. Uh, BICEP is still ongoing, the one who made the initial claim of detection. Uh, Planck has ended, but there's other satellite proposals that are also uh, being uh, tabled right now as well. So it's, uh, I think, a very bright future. Um, thanks for listening. I'm happy to take questions.